This is our fourth video in the Q&A series. And the questions which I have taken here were from the comments or the questions you, which you posted on video number three. All the questions which I have picked to be answered in this have been given in the comment box or the description below with the timestamp. So in case if you want to straight away go to a particular question, you can do that. And in many questions, the detailed concept has already been explained in the videos uh, which we have uploaded related uh, or along with those chapters. So I have also given the link of those videos so that you can go to that video and watch that complete video to understand the detailed concept. Because here, all the answers which I, have, uh, I will be giving would be in short so that you understand that concept. In case if you want to do it in detail, you can go to those videos uh, by following those links which are given in the description. The first question which I'm taking for this uh, Q&A series uh, video, fourth video, has been sent by Biswarup Mujumdar from Kolkata. And the question is about milk teeth and permanent teeth. Now we know that milk teeth Milk teeth, which are also known as baby teeth, they are also known as deciduous teeth. These teeth, they are 20 in number and their distribution is by the formula 2102 over 2102. And this formula we write when we suppose we draw the upper jaw and the lower jaw, then we write incisors here. So there are two incisors, then canines, one, one canine, no premolars. So this, this zero is for premolar and two is for molar. So this is only one half of the jaw that we are drawing here. So this upper number is for half of the upper jaw. And similarly, this is for the half of the lower jaw. Now in babies, when they have this milk teeth, the jaw is very small. So if we suppose draw this jaw, this is very small. So here are the incisors. These are two incisors. Then there is a canine. There is no enough space for all teeth to come here. So in milk dentition, there is no place for premolars. So what appear here are two molars. Now we know that in our jaw bones, teeth are already formed. That means beneath this, there is a permanent incisor ready. Here also permanent incisor ready. Here is a canine ready, permanent canine. Here, one, two and three premolars are ready. And beneath this, there would be two permanent molars ready. So after the permanent dentition, the formula is permanent set. Formula is 2, 1, 2, 3. So this is incisors, canines, premolars and molars. So these two would be permanent incisors. The here at below this one would be the permanent canine. Then below these two would be the permanent premolars and these three would be the permanent molars. Basically, in the jaw of a small child, there are no enough spaces available for all the teeth to erupt. But as the babies, they start chewing food after the age of six, seven months. So they need some grinding teeth and that is why these molars are there. These are the primary molars they would be replaced by permanent premolars. So actually, the function of primary dentition is basically to provide proper position for the permanent set to erupt. So temporary teeth provide proper position for the permanent teeth to erupt. 
So this is uh, apart from the basic function of biting, chewing and all those, the permanent sets, permanent teeth which are already ready in the jaw, they need to come out in that right position and that position is guided by the slots or the sockets which are produced by these primary teeth when they are lost. So when the primary tooth is lost, this permanent is going to erupt from the same position. So these two, which are the primary molars, they are replaced by primary molars. They are replaced by the permanent premolars. Incisors replaced by incisors, canine replaced by canine. But the molars of temporary set are replaced by the permanent premolars and then there would be as the children grow the jaw also enlarges and now there is enough space for all these teeth to erupt. So in adults this would be the dental formula incisors canines premolars and molars and the last pair last molars they are known as wisdom teeth they erupt after the age of 18 19 and many a times the wisdom teeth never erupt. Wisdom teeth are the last molars in the jaws. So they never erupt because there's no enough space for these teeth to actually erupt. So basic function of primary is to give the proper slot so that the permanent teeth can appear there. Shabnam Sana from Bangalore has asked a question on action of enzyme and cofactors. Now enzymes work by lowering the activation energy. Activation energy is the energy which must be possessed by the substrate molecule to participate in a reaction. Suppose to understand this, say these are all different molecules which are participating in a reaction. All molecules, they possess some amount of energy and here to understand we are writing some numbers to show whatever unit of energy they have. Say this is having 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They have some amount of energy. In a reaction, to participate in the reaction, to come closer to each other, to make bonds, they have to have some minimum energy. Say that energy is 5. Activation energy is 5. So which all molecules will be able to participate in the reaction? The one with 5, one with 6, 7, 8. They will be able to participate. So now 1, 2, 3, 4 participate and here we get 4 product molecules. This is what happens in absence of enzyme. Now, if we add enzyme here, so this activation energy from 5 gets lowered to say 2. Now, if the activation energy is 2 because enzyme is facilitating, enzyme is helping those two substrate molecules to come closer. Now, when they can come closer with the less energy that they have, they can make new bonds. So now, even this molecule can participate, the one with three also, one with two also. So now, the number of product also increases from four because now you have three more changing into product. So it has gone to say seven. So if the product formation increases, we say the rate of enzymatic reaction has gone up. So how has the enzyme helped? in increasing this rate of enzymatic reaction is by lowering the activation energy. Now the second part is what exactly are coenzymes? Enzymes, when we use the word enzyme, we are actually talking about the functional molecule. This is known as holoenzyme. Holoenzyme is made up of two things. It is made up of a protein part and a non-protein part. The protein part is known as apoenzyme. A 
unless and until the non-protein part comes and binds with this EPO enzyme, this complete enzyme will not be ready. And this is the active part. Only EPO enzyme is going to be inactive. So this becomes active only when this non-protein part goes and binds with it. Now this non-protein part can be divided into three categories. We can call them cofactors. Cofactors are metallic ions which are temporarily attached. So these are metallic ions. So whenever this metallic ion would get attached to EPO enzyme, holo enzyme would be formed and the reaction would be helped. It could be coenzyme. Coenzymes are organic substances but non-proteins. Now there is a third term and the third term is prosthetic group. Now prosthetic group can be a cofactor also or a coenzyme also but the difference is prosthetic group is tightly attached. It has to be tightly attached. That means if we are talking of a prosthetic group, then it could be a metallic ion or it could be an organic compound, but it is permanently attached to the EPO enzyme. Such enzymes are all the time active because EPO enzyme and that prosthetic group is attached. But in other uh, cases, EPO enzyme is separate and at the time of reaction, the cofactor that is the metallic ion or the coenzyme would temporarily go attached with the EPO enzyme. It will become a functional enzyme and the reaction would be helped. Laksh Mishra from Punjab has asked, what type of cells undergo mitosis in haploid organisms to form gametes? Now, when we are talking of haploid organisms, we can take two examples. Haploid organisms like Chlamydomonas or yeast. We can take these two examples to understand. Now, a certain species of yeast, they are haploid and Chlamydomonas is haploid. So if we are talking of this haploid chlamydomonas, which is a biflagellate, it is leading its life like a haploid cell. And it reproduces by mitosis to form spores. And these spores, they are also biflagellate, smaller than the parent cell, but they are known as zoospores. Now, these zoospores, will grow and they become the normal bigger chlamydomonas cells. Again start leading their life as the haploid cells. But all organisms they have to undergo sexual reproduction so that the genetic recombination can take place. Whenever that has to happen these two cells the organisms they start behaving like gametes and if they behave like gametes, then it results into formation of a quadriflagellate zygote. Actually, the fusion takes place in this manner. This is a chlamydomonas with its two flagella. This is the other chlamydomonas with its two flagella. So this results into formation of a quadriflagellate zygote. So this is a 2N zygote. And it has four flagella because two individual cells have fused. They started behaving like gametes. So this was haploid, this was haploid, all are haploid. And now this zygote undergoes meiosis to form four haploid cells and they grow to form the normal adult cell. So gamete formation is actually not taking place as it takes place in higher organisms by zygote, this meiosis uh, which takes place in uh, say germinal cells. Here, the cell, the individual cell is acting as gamete and that is why in many cases we call it hologamy. This fusion is 
is known as hologamy because the cells are fusing. They are acting as hologamy. The cells are acting as gametes. They are haploid. They act as gametes, fused to form zygote. Zygote divides by meiosis and again haploid cells are formed. M. A. Rajas has asked, what is Bordox mixture? B. O. R. D. E. A. U. X. Bordox mixture. It is also known as Bordo mixture or Bordo mixture. This is a mixture of two substances, copper sulfate. It is Cu2 sulfate that is CuSO4 and slaked lime and slaked lime that is CaOH whole twice. It is a mixture of these two things and it is used as fungicide, used as fungicide. That is to kill fungal infection, especially in vineyards. Especially in vineyards. It can be used anywhere else also. And normally when these plants get infected by various fungi, then there are diseases like smuts and all. So to take care of those diseases, this mixture is used. Copper sulfate plus calcium hydroxide that is bordo mixture or bordox mixture pragati sharma from gwalior has sent this question and there are a few important informations which are there in the question the first point which is given is that there are certain bacteria which multiply every 35 minutes multiply every 35 minutes and this is some specific bacteria because when we are talking of general division time, then it is 20 minutes. So here it is a specific information which is given. And the original number which is given in the culture is 10 raised to the power 5. These many cells per milliliter. Third information which is given in the question is, that if these bacteria are allowed to multiply for 175 minutes, then what would be the number of cells in this culture? Now, we know that whenever bacteria multiply, they divide by binary fission. So every time they divide, the number is going to get doubled. Now, 10 raised to the power 5 can be written as 1 lakh. Now, in 175 minutes total, if bacteria divide every 35 minutes, so first 35 minutes, first division, next 35 minutes, next division. So actually there would be five divisions which would take place in this duration. So if we start with this number, first division, this number will double, it will become 2 lakh. Then second division, double of this, it will become 4 lakh. Third division, it will become double of this, that is 8 lakh. Fourth division, it will become double of this, that is 16 lakh. And fifth division, it will become double of this, that is 30, 32 lakh. We can reach to the number like this. 32 lakh is 32 into 10 to the power 5. Say, the answer is this. But as we don't have the time to do it this way, we can also do a shortcut method. Shortcut is 2 to the power n into whatever is given in the original one. Because here, the division is taking place 5 times, our n becomes 5. So it is 2 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 5. This is the original one. Here what exactly we mean, it is 2 into 2 into 2, this is 5 times. So, are we reaching to the same number? 2 into 2 is 4, 4 into 2 is 8, 8 into 2 is 16, 16 into 2 is 32. You again get the same answer. So, whether you solve it by this method or by this long method, you would reach to the answer. 
The next question which I am taking has been asked by two students, Abid Hussain uh, from Manipur and Ashad Khan. And the question is, how are secondary medullary rays formed? Let us talk about the primary medullary rays and we will see the secondary one. Now, if this is a vascular bundle or say these are the two vascular bundles, in the vascular bundles are present the cambium strips. This cambium is known as intrafascicular cambium. Intrafascicular cambium. And outside this is phloem, inner is xylem. Same here, phloem and xylem. In between these vascular bundles are present parenchymatous cells. These parenchymatous cells, because they get squeezed between this vascular tissue, the cells, they become little long. So instead of appearing like regular spherical isodiametric parenchymatous cells, they appear flattened because they get squeezed between these two structures. This is primary medullary rays. These are primary medullary rays. They extend from the cortex up to the pith. That means here they would extend from this region which is going to be cortex up to the central part which is pith. So we can say they extend from cortex to pith. Now when secondary growth takes place, during secondary growth what happens is a cambium ring is formed. This cambium remains as it is. The cells of medullary rays here, they would also become meristematic. So this results into formation of a cambium strip or cambium ring rather. This is intrafascicular. Between two intra, there would be this interfascicular cambium. So this is interfascicular cambium. Now, this cambium ring is going to produce secondary phloem on the outer side and secondary xylem on the inner side. Now, let us talk about this vascular cambium. When it divides, it produces new cells, those cells will be the secondary phloem. So, what is going to happen is this primary phloem will be shifted outwards. The primary phloem, it shifts out and here new phloem will be formed. Now when this new phloem is formed, this cambium again produces few parenchymatous cells which again get squeezed between this. Same thing happens on the inner side. This primary xylem gets shifted inner and here the secondary xylem appears. So this is the secondary xylem and in between again these parenchymatous cells are formed. Now again because they are squeezed, they look like rays or longitudinal cells. So this is the secondary medullary ray or medullary rays. They are formed from the intrafascicular or vascular cambium. Formed from vascular cambium. And as the primary ones were extending from cortex to pith, they extend only between phloem and xylem. So this secondary medullary rays, they extend between xylem and phloem only. And the function is same, they also help in lateral conduction. Help in lateral conduction. So this is how the secondary medullary rays are formed. The next question which I am taking has been asked by Shanur Rahman from Gaya. And this question is about double fertilization. Double fertilization is a characteristic feature of angiosperms. 
it is seen only in angiosperms. This process was or is completed in two steps actually. The first process is simple fertilization which is syngamy, syngamy that is fertilization. In fertilization it is fusion of egg with first male gamete and this results into formation of zygote. The second one is fusion of two polar nuclei with the second male gamete. This process is known as triple fusion and triple fusion results in formation of endosperm nucleus which ultimately divides to form the nutritive tissue that is endosperm. Here zygote is formed and here triploid endosperm is formed. This is the nutritive tissue. Now two scientists who gave this processes separately Syngamy or fertilization was explained by Strasburger and the triple fusion or the complete double fertilization together was given by Navaschin and the two plants in which it was studied for the first time were Lilia and Fritillaria. Now this complete process is a long process. I have uh, prepared one animation to explain this process in detail. The link of that video which has this animation to explain this complete double fertilization. The link has been given below in the description. You may want to watch that video to understand this process completely. So that would help you understand and with visual uh, effect it would be even better to understand this concept. Madhu Tomar has asked a question on vascular cambium. These vascular cambium is meristematic tissue and as we are talking of vascular it is present between xylem and phloem. So in a vascular bundle between xylem and phloem is this strip of meristematic tissue which is called the vascular cambia. Outside is primary phloem. This is the outer side we are talking of. This is inner that is towards the pith and inner is primary xylem. The function of meristematic tissue is to continuously divide and produce new cells. So now when this meristematic tissue or vascular cambia, it divides, it is going to produce secondary phloem on the outer side and secondary xylem on the inner side because of which primary phloem gets pushed outwards and primary xylem gets pushed inwards. So this is the primary xylem and this is primary phloem. This activity is seen during secondary growth. Kajal Sharma from Hamirpur has sent this question and it is uh, the species though insignificant in number determines the existence of many other species in a given ecosystem such species would be known as the answer out of the given one is keystone keystone species. Such species, they are, they can be of animal or plant in an ecosystem, though their number is insignificant, but they are very unique in determining how an ecosystem works. Such type of species which have this deciding role in the working of ecosystem are known as keystone species. Lokesh Mishra from Delhi has asked this question on parthenogenesis in lizards. Now what exactly is parthenogenesis? Parthenogenesis means formation of an organism without fertilization. Formation of an organism from an egg 
without fertilization without fertilization now there are two types of parthenogenesis one is natural other is artificial natural is what happens in nature artificial is stimulated or triggered now this natural parthenogenesis are divided again into two categories as complete parthenogenesis or they can also be incomplete in case of incomplete we are talking of this first in case of incomplete it is only one type of organism which develops by parthenogenesis example is of bees in honey bees drones that is the males they develop by parthenogenesis by parthenogenesis the eggs do not get fertilized so they are formed from unfertilized eggs whereas these are males whereas the females whether it is queen or the workers queen is a fertile female workers are sterile females they develop from fertilized eggs so out of the two sexes it is only one sex which develops by parthenogenesis that is male such type of parthenogenesis is known as incomplete complete parthenogenesis is seen in two main cases and here we are talking of these reptiles that is lizards which the question was in a uh, rock lizard the scientific name of this rock lizard is uh this is lacerta saxicola armeniaca and there is one more example where we find this that is in the smallest indian snake its name is tiflina brahmina b a h brahmina this is the smallest indian snake now in this the parthenogenesis results in formation of females so females develop by parthenogenesis now these females which have developed by parthenogenesis means without fertilization so they are haploid now when they produce eggs the eggs are also haploid and these eggs again give rise to the females so in these organisms or in complete parthenogenesis which is seen in case of lizards all the organisms which are there they are only females because female develop by parthenogenesis they are haploid they produce haploid eggs and again eggs without fertilization develop into females so in case of lizards especially these rock lizards or which are known as lacerta and this snake this is the smallest indian snake in these organisms the parthenogenetic method which is seen is complete and these are natural naturally occurring parthenogenetic processes Kali Prasad Rai from Noida has asked this question, and it is about which type of uh, plant out of the four options has X current stem, and the options which are given here are cycas, then pinus, wheat, and mango. Pinus, wheat, and D option is mango. Now here we need to know which type of stems are we talking about. There are four different types of stems. When we talk of vertical stem, then we call them culum, cordex, excurrent, and decurrent. So the basic classification is culum. Here the nodes are solid, but the internodes are hollow, and this is the stem which is found in bamboo or 
out of these in weed. So here the stem is going to be long with distinct nodes and internodes. The nodes are uh, sorry, the nodes are solid, internodes are hollow, and this is unbranched. There is no branching here. So this is culum and it is found in bamboo and wheat. So here this would have culum. Now the second one is cordex. In cordex, the stem is unbranched and all the leaves, they arise at the top of this stem in the form of a crown. This is what we get in case of palm or cycas. So here it's going to be cordex type of stem. The third is known as excurrent. Excurrent has branching and the branching is acropital. That means this is the main axis and all the branches, they grow in an acropital manner. That means lower branch is bigger and oldest. Then as we move up, the branches get younger and smaller. Because of which the stem gets a typical cone shape. And this is a characteristic feature of pinus. And in case of mango, the the type of branching is known as decurrent or deliquescent. Decurrent or deliquescent. Here, there is no pattern of branching. So the main stem is there and then you can see all types of random branchings. This is known as the decurrent or deliquescent type. This is seen in case of mango. So we can call it D current or deliquescent. So out of four options for X current, pinus would show this X current type of branching. Kumar Kanishk from Vetiha Vihar has asked a question on cranial cavity or cranial capacity rather of four uh, organisms. The organisms means all the uh, individuals or organisms which were there in the evolution of humans. So here we have uh, first is pecking man, pecking man, second is java man, third is of modern man and fourth is of handy man. Handy map. Now, let us write down the cranial capacities of all these four uh, organisms which were there uh, during human evolution. So, the first one is pecking man. The cranial capacity was 1300 cubic centimeter. The next is Java man, 900 cubic centimeter. Modern man, that is 1450 cubic centimeters and handyman which is also known as homo habilis 800 cubic centimeters. So this is commonly known as homo habilis. So out of all these, okay let us write down few more names here. Java man is homo erectus, erectus. Homo erectus erectus and this is known as Homo erectus pecensis. So these are the scientific names of these modern man we already know. It is Homo sapiens sapiens. And so out of these, the most evolved are considered as the modern man, that is we in this present situation, because out of all these, this is the maximum cranial capacity. So this can be asked like just to find out what is the cranial capacity or this question can be asked uh, in the form of arrange them in the order of increasing or decreasing cranial capacities. The next question has been asked by Nisha from Punjab and the question is 
what is a common test to find genotype of a hybrid as a hybrid is mission, uh, mentioned here we would be using test cross to find the genotype we use test cross genotype of any unknown but here it is mentioned that you have to find the genotype of the hybrid now when hybrid word is written the genotype is automatically known to us because hybrid means there is one dominant allele and one recessive allele. So without even any cross, by using that word itself, we are able to find out or know the genotype of this, whether it is a monohybrid or a dihybrid. If it was a dihybrid, then we would have written heterozygous condition for one trait and the heterozygous condition for other trait. So in this question, once we have a hybrid word, we just can simply write, we use test cross. But test cross is used to identify the genotype of an unknown. If you're not sure whether the unknown is homozygous dominant, heterozygous or recessive, then we use a test cross. And in test cross, the unknown is crossed with one of the parents. And that parent is homozygous recessive. And we have standard ratios which we get. So in case if this is, this was our unknown, we would have crossed it with pure homozygous recessive. And after plotting the punit square and putting the gametes of one plant here and the other one here, this would have been heterozygous tall, this would have been recessive, heterozygous tall and recessive. In this case, the ratio that, sorry, the ratio that we get is 2 is to 2. So, in a test cross, if we get a ratio of 2 is to 2 or 1 is to 1, then our unknown is a hybrid or heterozygous. Sonali Kamthekar from Maharashtra has asked who gave artificial classification system Aristotle or Linnaeus? It was given by Linnaeus. Linnaeus who is also known as father of taxonomy, he was the one who gave artificial system of classification and his classification was based on Okay, before this, let me tell you what exactly is artificial system. A classification which is done using one or few characters. Using one or few characters. All characters are not taken. So if all characters are taken, then that system of class classification is known as natural system. Here, when we are saying Linnaeus was the one who was or who is responsible for giving us this artificial system, he used only one character and that was, it was based on the sexual part of the flower or of the plant and he used androsium. And specifically when he was talking about androsium, the things which were uh, taken into account were number of androsia or number of uh, stamen. Then how are they present? Are they single? Are they joined, double, triple or the arrangement? So length of filament, how many bundles they are forming and based on this, the classification was done as monoandria. So when there was only one stamen there, diandria with two in number, triandria, tetra, penta and so on and finally polyandria. So now because it was only uh, the male reproductive part which was taken into account, as we said if the system or if the classification is based on one or few characters, then we would call it artificial system. So it was Linnaeus who gave this artificial system of classification. Pooja Singh has asked why secondary oocyte gets arrested at metaphase. Now this is from the oogenesis part. When primary oocyte 
undergoes the division. Primary oocyte, it undergoes maturation phase, meiosis 1. And it results in formation of secondary oocyte and a smaller cell which is known as the polar body. As this body is formed the first body, then we call it first polar body. Second will be formed later on. This is this, okay, this is, we know is reductional division. So this is a diploid cell and secondary oocyte is haploid. This is the stage when ovulation takes place. So normally we say that ovulation is a process when the egg is released. But actually it is not the egg yet. It is secondary oocyte. It will be released and it is going to remain in the fallopian tube for about 48 hours. During this time, if fertilization takes place then meiosis 2 because it is only half of the division then meiosis 2 is going to get triggered so this secondary oocyte is arrested in metaphase 2 it has entered meiosis 2 prophase 2 has already taken place in metaphase 2 the division gets suspended or halted this would be triggered by fertilization. So as soon as the sperm enters, the process is going to continue and this would result into formation of the ova or egg and the second polar body will be formed. Now the reason why this is arrested here is because as soon as this division continues and the nucleus of the sperm has entered, before the nucleus of the egg assembles, the genetic material of the egg and the sperm, they fuse. So, as soon as the sperm touches the membrane of the egg, the process of this division continues. And that is why it is released in secondary oocyte stage and the division remains arrested in metaphase 2. Archdeep Singh from Punjab has asked, what are monoclonal antibodies? Monoclonal antibodies. These antibodies, which are called monoclonal antibodies, they are obtained or they are prepared using hybridoma technique. Hybridoma technique. Now this technique was developed by, sorry, hybridoma technique. This was developed by two scientists. Milstein and Kohler. They developed this technique and basically in this technique the uh, basic principle which was used was to combine the properties of two different types of cells. One cell which was chosen was myeloma cell. Myeloma cells are cancerous cells and the property which was to be used was their division power. So they divide continuously. So this is one property of cancerous cell that is myeloma cell was used. And these cells were fused with another cell. Those cells were lymphocytes. Now lymphocyte also has a special property. Lymphocytes, we are talking about B lymphocytes. So these B lymphocytes, their property is when they get stimulated by a particular antigen, they produce antibody against only that antigen. So if we take this lymphocyte and it is stimulated by a particular antigen, then its property is, sorry, antigen. Its property is to produce antibody only against this particular antigen. These two cells were fused and the cell which was obtained was called hybridoma. Now this cell had the properties of these two cells. It was capable of dividing outside the body in an uncontrolled manner and because of this antigen stimulation it was capable of producing antibodies only against a particular antigen. This cell was allowed to divide and this division is mitotic division. 
When this cell divides by mitosis to form many cells, all these cells are basically clones of this particular cell hybridoma cell. And we can call them monoclones. And now these monoclones, because they are dividing due to the property of myeloma cell, and they would be producing antibodies only against this particular antigen. So here we would get the antibodies. All these antibodies are produced only by these clones, which we are calling monoclones. So we call these antibodies as monoclonal antibodies. Now the advantage of this is, suppose we get an antigen in our body, this process gets stimulated, that means B lymphocytes are stimulated by the antigen and we prepare our own antibodies. But in certain cases, we depend on ready-made antibodies, especially like in case of snake bite. If the snake's venom enters into a blood, we need ready-made antibodies to destroy that venom, which is acting as an antigen immediately. So we need ready-made antibodies. These ready-made antibodies are obtained from animals like horses. So the venom is injected into the body of the horse. The horse will produce antibody. We take that antibody out in the serum and that is taken as anti-sera where we are taking ready-made antibodies. So if snake's venom was injected into the horse, the horse must have produced antibodies against that venom. But if the snake, uh, sorry, the horse had some other kind of infection, the animal would have produced antibody against that infection also. And those antibodies will also be there in the serum. So what we take are antibodies against venom plus some other antibodies. And these antibodies are proteins. So we are taking antibodies against venom, but some proteins which are coming along with it, those could be antigenic to us. So we want to minimize that problem also, that risk also. And here, the antibody which we would be taking is going to be pure antibody. There is no risk of any other protein or any other particle coming into our body. This antibody is going to be specific against only that particular antigen. So these antibodies, because they have been obtained by all these monoclones, we call them monoclonal antibodies. And the technique is known as hybridoma technique or hybridoma technology. Mayank Varane has asked a question that if fetus is AB positive, fetus has a blood group that is AB positive, Will there be any kind of incompatibility because AB positive is universal recipient. Now this is a universal recipient blood group. This is correct. But here we are talking of fetus being AB positive. Again, if we talk of this fetus being AB positive, that means on the RBC of the fetus, there is antigen A, antigen B, and even RH. That is why this fetus is RH positive. And as we are using this term fetus, that means it is growing in the body of the female. And if the female happens to be negative for any blood group, then in that case, what we have discussed earlier when we were talking about ABO and RH incompatibility in the chapter of circulation, we discussed it in detail that in the beginning, during nine months of gestation period, it is only the mother's blood which is circulating. And there is nothing in mother's blood, assuming that the female is negative, because here there is nothing mentioned about the blood group of the mother. So assuming if the mother is Rh negative, then it is only the blood of the mother which is circulating through the umbilical cord. And as there is no antigen or anti-Rh here, there is no problem to the fetus. But at the time of parturition, when the two-way flow of blood takes place or there is mixing of blood, what is going to go into the body of the mother is this Rh antigen. 
as soon as this RH comes into the mother's body, mother prepares anti-RH. And as we said, there is two-way flow. The mother's blood now going into the fetus would be carrying this anti-RH, the antibody against RH. And the RBCs of the fetus would be destroyed. Here, there is no threat to the life of the fetus, but the baby when born would be born with jaundice and anemia because many RBCs would be destroyed. So here the question seems to be a little incomplete because we have mentioned only about fetus. But what is the situation in case of mother? And if mother is AB positive, then there is no incompatibility. So we have to know what is the blood group of the female or the mother before we can conclude whether there would be incompatibility or not. The next question is from Raj Kiran from Hyderabad. And the question is, why is cancer caused when we have tumor suppressing genes like P53? Now this P53 is a tumor suppressing gene. All individuals have it, but the cancer uh, condition is caused due to substances which we call carcinogens. Carcinogens act in two ways. Number one, they are going to suppress this gene. Suppress the tumor suppressing gene. Tumor suppressing gene. What is the function of this gene? It is suppressing tumor. That means it is not letting tumor formation. And these carcinogens, they suppress the activity. So this tumor suppressing gene no longer is able to work. It is no longer able to suppress the tumor formation. That means the carcinogen would trigger tumor formation. The second way these carcinogens work, we all have proto-oncogenes. Proto-oncogenes. These genes are inactive. So tube, these carcinogens, they convert these proto-oncogenes into oncogenes. And oncogenes are again tumor inducing. So carcinogens, they are working in two ways. They are suppressing the tumor suppressing gene of our body, which is not letting tumor form. So if the gene gets suppressed, then carcinogen will stimulate tumor formation. And second, it converts inactive gene into active. And as soon as oncogenes, that is the active genes are formed, they again trigger tumor formation. Kumar Kanish from Abhetiha Bihar has asked a question on gene mapping. Frequencies of genes are given in the question and we have to map those genes. The frequencies which are mentioned is the recombination frequency of gene A and B is 9%, gene A and C is 17% and gene B and C is 26%. Now what exactly is meant by this recombination frequency? The genes which are located on a chromosome, say this is a chromosome, one gene A is located here and the other gene, say B, we are talking of, is located here. Then what are the chances that they would undergo recombination? Recombination means, A, suppose this is the homologous chromosome, and here is B and A, the recessive ones. So what would be the recombination? The dominant allele goes with the recessive, and this goes with this. This is recombination. Recombination is going to take place during crossing over. So, Closer the genes, less would be the chances of their getting separated or less would be the recombination frequency. Suppose we talk of a gene here. So what are the recombination frequencies possible? Maximum. Whenever crossing over takes place anywhere, these two genes would get separated and would recombine. So using this frequencies, now let us map them. All the genes are arranged in a linear manner on the chromosome. 
we normally start with the maximum frequency and this frequency actually gives us the distance between the genes. So say this is gene A, sorry let us take the biggest one, biggest frequency, B and this is gene C. They are 26 map units apart. That means there are 26 percent chances that they would get separated. Now there is a reference we have we are done with this. Let us take this A and C. The distance between C and A is 17 percent. That means there are 17 units apart. So we can take A on this side also or this side also. But they have given us a clue between A and B also. So if we place A here, this would be 9 map units, distance between A and B, 9 map units. And A and C would be 70. 17 and 9 would give us 26. So now our arrangement of genes would be B, A and C. So this is going to be the arrangement of genes on the chromosome based on these recombination frequencies which are given. So with this we have come to the end of our fourth video. Now the questions which you want to ask me again, you will have to post those questions in the comment box of this video and I'll take those questions up. And the next video will be uploaded on March 20th, that is Monday.